Nehemiah, chapter 1. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. In the month of Kislev, in the twentieth year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, Those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And I said, O oh Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. Chapter 2 In the month of Nisan, in the twentieth year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before, so the king asked me, Why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid. But I said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, What is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah, where my fathers are buried, so that I can rebuild it. Then the king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked me, how long will your journey take, and when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. I also said to him, If it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of Trans-Euphrates, so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah? And may I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the king's forest, so he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple, and for the city wall, and for the residence I will occupy? And because the gracious hand of my God was upon me, the king granted my requests. So I went to the governors of Trans-Euphrates and gave them the king's letters. The king had also sent army officers and cavalry with me. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few men. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. By night I went out through the valley gate toward the jackal well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on toward the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through. So I went up the valley by night examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God upon me and what the king had said to me. They replied, Let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. But when Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, 
and Geshem, the Arab, heard about it. They mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you are doing? They asked. Are you rebelling against the king? I answered them by saying, The God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. Chapter 3 Eliashib the high priest and his fellow priests went to work and rebuilt the sheep gate. They dedicated it and set its doors in place, building as far as the Tower of the Hundred, which they dedicated, and as far as the Tower of Hananel. The men of Jericho built the adjoining section, and Zachar, son of Imri, built next to them. The fish gate was rebuilt by the sons of Hassaneah. They laid its beams and put its doors and bolts and bars in place. Miramoth, son of Uriah, the son of Hakaz, repaired the next section. Next to him, Meshulam, son of Berechiah, the son of Meshezabel, made repairs. And next to him, Zadok, son of Baana, also made repairs. The next section was repaired by the men of Tekoa, but their nobles would not put their shoulders to the work under their supervisors. The Jeshina gate was repaired by Joiada, son of Pasea, and Meshulam, son of Besadea. They laid its beams and put its doors and bolts and bars in place. Next to them, repairs were made by men from Gibeon and Mizpah, Melatiah of Gibeon, and Jadon of Moranah, places under the authority of the governor of Trans-Euphrates. Uzziel, son of Harhaiah, one of the goldsmiths, repaired the next section, and Hananiah, one of the perfume makers, made repairs next to that. They restored Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. Rephaiah, son of Hur, ruler of a half-district of Jerusalem, repaired the next section. Adjoining this, Judea, son of Harumaph, made repairs opposite his house, and Hadish, son of Hashibnia, made repairs next to him. Melchijah, son of Haram, and Hashab, son of Pehath Moab, repaired another section, and the tower of the ovens. Shalom, son of Halohesh, ruler of a half-district of Jerusalem, repaired the next section with the help of his daughters. The valley gate was repaired by Hanan and the residents of Zenoah. They rebuilt it and put its doors and bolts and bars in place. They also repaired 500 yards of the wall as far as the dung gate. The dung gate was repaired by Malchijah, son of Rechab, ruler of the district of beth Hakarim. He rebuilt it and put its doors and bolts and bars in place. The fountain gate was repaired by Shalon, son of Kolhoza, ruler of the district of Mizpah. He rebuilt it, roofing it over and putting its doors and bolts and bars in place. He also repaired the wall of the pool of Siloam by the king's garden, as far as the steps going down from the city of David. Beyond him, Nehemiah, son of Azbuk, ruler of the half-district of Beth Zor, made repairs up to a point opposite the tombs of David as far as the artificial pool and the house of the heroes. Next to him, the repairs were made by the Levites under Rehum, son of Benai. Beside him, Hashabiah, ruler of half the district of Keilah, carried out repairs for his district. Next to him, the repairs were made by their countrymen under Binuai, son of Henadad, ruler of the other half district of Keilah. Next to him, Ezer, son of Jeshua, ruler of Mizpah, repaired another section from a point facing the ascent to the armory as far as the angle. Next to him, Barak, son of Zabai, zealously repaired another section from the angle to the entrance of the house of Eliashib the high priest. Next to him, Miramoth, son of Uriah, the son of Hakaz, repaired another section from the entrance of Eliashib's house to the end of it. The repairs next to him were made by the priests from the surrounding region. Beyond them, Benjamin and Hashab made repairs in front of their house. And next to them, Azariah, son of Maaseah, the son of Ananiah, made repairs beside his house. Next to him, Binuai, son of Henadad, repaired another section, from Azariah's house to the angle and the corner. And Pelal, son of Uzai, worked opposite the angle and the tower projecting from the upper palace near the court of the guard. Next to him, Padea, son of Perash, and the temple servants living on the hill of Ophel, 
made repairs up to a point opposite the water gate, toward the east, and the projecting tower. Next to them, the men of Tekoa repaired another section, from the great projecting tower to the wall of Ophel. Above the horse gate, the priests made repairs, each in front of his own house. Next to them, Zadok, son of Immer, made repairs opposite his house. Next to him, Shemaiah, son of Shechaniah, the guard at the east gate, made repairs. Next to him, Hananiah, son of Shelemiah, and Hanan, the sixth son of Zalaph, repaired another section. Next to them, Meshulam, son of Berechiah, made repairs opposite his living quarters. Next to him, Melchijah, one of the goldsmiths, made repairs as far as the house of the temple servants and the merchants, opposite the inspection gate, and as far as the room above the corner. And between the room above the corner and the sheep gate, the goldsmiths and merchants made repairs. Chapter 4 When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, What they are building, even if a fox climbed up on it, he would break down their wall of stones. Hear us, O our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall, till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the men of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead, and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, The strength of the laborers is giving out, and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also our enemies said, Before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and will kill them and put an end to the work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, Wherever you turn, they will attack us. Therefore I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your brothers, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to his own work. From that day on, half of my men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other, and each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked. But the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. Then I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, The work is extensive and spread out, and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. So we continued the work with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn till the stars came out. At that time, I also said to the people, Have every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night so they can serve us as guards by night and workmen by day. Neither I, nor my brothers, nor my men, nor the guards with me took off our clothes. Each had his weapon, even when he went for water. Chapter 5 now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their Jewish brothers. Some were saying, We and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. Others were saying, We are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our homes to get grain during the famine. Still others were saying, We have had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. 
Although we are of the same flesh and blood as our countrymen, and though our sons are as good as theirs, yet we have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. When I heard their outcry and these charges, I was very angry. I pondered them in my mind and then accused the nobles and officials. I told them, you are exacting usury from your own countrymen. So I called together a large meeting to deal with them and said, as far as possible, we have bought back our Jewish brothers who were sold to the Gentiles. Now you are selling your brothers only for them to be sold back to us. They kept quiet because they could find nothing to say. So I continued, What you are doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? I and my brothers and my men are also lending the people money and grain, but let the exacting of usury stop. Give back to them immediately their fields, vineyards, olive groves, and houses, and also the usury you are charging them, the hundredth part of the money, grain, new wine, and oil. We will give it back, they said and we will not demand anything more from them. We will do as you say. Then I summoned the priests and made the nobles and officials take an oath to do what they had promised. I also shook out the folds of my robe and said, In this way may God shake out of his house and possessions every man who does not keep this promise. So may such a man be shaken out and emptied. At this the whole assembly said, Amen! And praised the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. Moreover, from the twentieth year of King Artaxerxes, when I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, until his thirty-second year, twelve years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allotted to the governor. But the earlier governors, those preceding me, placed a heavy burden on the people and took forty shekels of silver from them in addition to food and wine. Their assistants also lorded it over the people. But out of reverence for God, I did not act like that. Instead, I devoted myself to the work on this wall. All my men were assembled there for the work. We did not acquire any land. Furthermore, a hundred and fifty Jews and officials ate at my table, as well as those who came to us from the surrounding nations. Each day, one ox, six choice sheep, and some poultry were prepared for me, and every ten days, an abundant supply of wine of all kinds. In spite of all this, I never demanded the food allotted to the governor, because the demands were heavy on these people. Remember me with favor, O oh my God, for all I have done for these people. Chapter 6 When word came to Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall, and not a gap was left in it, though up to that time I had not set the doors and the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent me this message. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. But they were scheming to harm me. So I sent messengers to them with this reply. I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same message, and each time I gave them the same answer. Then the fifth time, Sanballat sent his aid to me with the same message, and in his hand was an unsealed letter, in which was written, It is reported among the nations, and Geshem says it is true, that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt, and therefore you are building the wall. Moreover, according to these reports, you were about to become their king, and have even appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah! Now, this report will get back to the king, so come, let us confer together. I sent him this reply. Nothing like what you are saying is happening. You are just making it up out of your head. They were all trying to frighten us, thinking, Their hands will get too weak for the work, and it will not be completed. But I prayed, Now strengthen my hands. One day, I went to the house of Shemaiah, son of Deleah, the son of Mehetabel, who was shut in at his home. He said, let us meet in the house of God, inside the temple, and let us close the temple doors, because men are coming to kill you. By night they are coming to kill you. But I said, Should a man like me run away? Or should one like me go into the temple to save his life? I will not go. I realized that God had not sent him, but that he had prophesied against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. He had been hired to intimidate me. 
so that I would commit a sin by doing this, and then they would give me a bad name to discredit me. Remember Tobiah and Sanballat, O my God, because of what they have done. Remember also the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets who have been trying to intimidate me. So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elo, in 52 days. When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. Also in those days, the nobles of Judah were sending many letters to Tobiah, and replies from Tobiah kept coming to them. For many in Judah were under oath to him, since he was son-in-law to Shechaniah, son of Era, and his son Jehohanan had married the daughter of Meshulam, son of Berechiah. Moreover, they kept reporting to me his good deeds, and then telling him what I said. And Tobiah sent letters to intimidate me. Chapter 7 After the wall had been rebuilt, and I had set the doors in place, the gatekeepers and the singers and the Levites were appointed. I put in charge of Jerusalem my brother Hanani, along with Hananiah, the commander of the citadel, because he was a man of integrity and feared God more than most men do. I said to them, The gates of Jerusalem are not to be opened until the sun is hot. While the gatekeepers are still on duty, have them shut the doors and bar them. Also, appoint residents of Jerusalem as guards, some at their posts and some near their own houses. Now the city was large and spacious, but there were few people in it, and the houses had not yet been rebuilt. So my God put it into my heart to assemble the nobles, the officials, and the common people for registration by families. I found the genealogical record of those who had been the first to return. This is what I found written there. These are the people of the province who came up from the captivity of the exiles, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had taken captive. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his own town, in company with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Azariah, Rehemiah, Nehemani, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mizpireth, Bigvi, Nehem, and Baana. The list of the men of Israel, the descendants of Parash, 2,172, of Shephatiah, 372, of Era, 652, of Pehath Moab, through the line of Jeshua and Joab, 2,818, of Elam, 1,254, of Zatu, 845, of Zakai, 760, of Binuai, 648, of Bibai, 628, of Asgad, 2,322, of Adonikam, 667, of Bigvi, 2,067, of Aden, 655, of Ater through Hezekiah, 98, of Hashem, 328, of Bezai, 324, of Hareph, 112, of Gibeon, 95, the men of Bethlehem and Natopha, 188, of Anathoth, 128, of Beth Asmaveth, 42, of Kiriath Jerim, Kephira and Beeroth, 743, of Ramah and Geba, 621, of Michmash, 122, of Bethel and Ai, 123, of the other Nebo, 52, of the other Elam, 1,254, of Haram, 320, of Jericho, 345, of Lod, Hadid, and Ono, 721, of Sinea, 3,930, the priests, the descendants of Judea, through the family of Jeshua, 973, of Immer, 1,052, of Pasher, 1,247, of Haram, 1,017, the Levites, the descendants of Jeshua, through Cadmiel, through the Lion of Hodaviah, 74, the singers, the descendants of Asaph, 148, the gatekeepers, the descendants of Shalom, Ater, Talman, Akab, Hatita, and Shobai, 138, the temple servants, the descendants of Ziha, Asufa, Tabeoth, Kiros, 
Saya, Padan, Labena, Hagaba, Shalmai, Hanan, Giddel, Gehar, Rhea, Reason, Nakoda, Gazam, Uzza, Pasia, Besai, Miyunim, Nefusim, Bakbuk, Hakufa, Harher, Basla, Mehida, Harsha, Barkos, Sisera, Tima, Neziah, and Hatifa, the descendants of the servants of Solomon, the descendants of Sotai, Sophereth, Perida, Jaela, Darkon, Giddel, Shephatiah, Hattel, Pokereth Hazabaim, and Ammon. The temple servants and the descendants of the servants of Solomon, 392. The following came up from the towns of Telmila, Telharsha, Kirub, Adon, and Immer, but they could not show that their families were descended from Israel. The descendants of Delea, Tobiah, and Nicoda, 642. And from among the priests, the descendants of Hobea, Hakaz, and Barzillai, a man who had married a daughter of Barzillai the Gileadite, and was called by that name. These searched for their family records, but they could not find them, and so were excluded from the priesthood as unclean. The governor, therefore, ordered them not to eat any of the most sacred food until there should be a priest ministering with the Urim and Thummim. The whole company numbered 42,360, besides their 7,337 men servants and maid servants, and they also had 245 men and women singers. There were 736 horses, 245 mules, 435 camels, and 6,720 donkeys. Some of the heads of the families contributed to the work. The governor gave to the treasury 1,000 drachmas of gold, 50 bowls, and 530 garments for priests. Some of the heads of the families gave to the treasury for the work 20,000 drachmas of gold and 2,200 minas of silver. The total given by the rest of the people was 20,000 drachmas of gold, 2,000 minas of silver, and 67 garments for priests. The priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, and the temple servants, along with certain of the people and the rest of the Israelites, settled in their own towns. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, chapter 8, all the people assembled as one man in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra the scribe to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra the scribe stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. Beside him on his right, stood Mattathiah, Shema, Aneah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Maaseah. And on his left were Pedeah, Mishael, Malkijah, Hashem, Heshbadana, Zechariah, and Meshulam. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God. And all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen! Amen! Then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The Levites, Jeshua, Benai, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akab, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Maaseah, Kalita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, and Peleah instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law of God making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people could understand what was being read. Then Nehemiah, the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, This day is sacred to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks, and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is sacred to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be still, for this is a sacred day. Do not grieve. 
Then all the people went away to eat and drink, to send portions of food, and to celebrate with great joy, because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. On the second day of the month, the heads of all the families, along with the priests and the Levites, gathered around Ezra the scribe to give attention to the words of the law. They found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded through Moses, that the Israelites were to live in booths during the feast of the seventh month, and that they should proclaim this word and spread it throughout their towns and in Jerusalem. Go out into the hill country and bring back branches from olive and wild olive trees and from myrtles, palms, and shade trees to make booths, as it is written. So the people went out and brought back branches and built themselves booths on their own roofs, in their courtyards, in the courts of the house of God, and in the square by the water gate, and the one by the gate of Ephraim. The whole company that had returned from exile built booths and lived in them. From the days of Joshua son of Nun until that day, the Israelites had not celebrated it like this, and their joy was very great. Day after day, from the first day to the last, Ezra read from the book of the law of God. They celebrated the feast for seven days, and on the eighth day, in accordance with the regulation, there was an assembly. Chapter 9 On the twenty-fourth day of the same month, the Israelites gathered together, fasting and wearing sackcloth and having dust on their heads. Those of Israelite descent had separated themselves from all foreigners. They stood in their places and confessed their sins and the wickedness of their fathers. They stood where they were and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day and spent another quarter in confession and in worshiping the Lord their God. Standing on the stairs were the Levites, Jeshua, Benai, Cadmiel, Shebaniah, Bunai, Sherebiah, Benai, and Canaanai, who called with loud voices to the Lord their God, and the Levites, Jeshua, Cadmiel, Benai, Hashabniah, Sherebiah, Odiah, Shebaniah, and Pethahiah, said, Stand up and praise the Lord your God, who is from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, and may it be exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens, and all their starry host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to everything, and the multitudes of heaven worship you. You are the Lord God, who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and named him Abraham. You found his heart faithful to you, and you made a covenant with him to give to his descendants the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Jebusites, and Girgashites. You have kept your promise because you are righteous. You saw the suffering of our forefathers in Egypt. You heard their cry at the Red Sea. You sent miraculous signs and wonders against Pharaoh, against all his officials and all the people of his land. For you knew how arrogantly the Egyptians treated them. You made a name for yourself which remains to this day. You divided the sea before them so that they passed through it on dry ground. But you hurled their pursuers into the depths like a stone into mighty waters. By day you led them with a pillar of cloud, and by night with a pillar of fire, to give them light on the way they were to take. You came down on Mount Sinai, you spoke to them from heaven, you gave them regulations and laws that are just and right, and decrees and commands that are good. You made known to them your holy Sabbath, and gave them commands, decrees, and laws through your servant Moses. In their hunger you gave them bread from heaven, and in their thirst you brought them water from the rock. You told them to go in and take possession of the land you had sworn with uplifted hand to give them. But they, our forefathers, became arrogant and stiff-necked, and did not obey your commands. They refused to listen, and failed to remember the miracles you performed among them. They became stiff-necked, and in their rebellion appointed a leader in order to return to their slavery. But you are a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and 
and abounding in love. Therefore you did not desert them, even when they cast for themselves an image of a calf and said, This is your God who brought you up out of Egypt. Or when they committed awful blasphemies. Because of your great compassion, you did not abandon them in the desert. By day, the pillar of cloud did not cease to guide them on their path, nor the pillar of fire by night to shine on the way they were to take. You gave your good spirit to instruct them. You did not withhold your manna from their mouths, and you gave them water for their thirst. For forty years you sustained them in the desert. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out, nor did their feet become swollen. You gave them kingdoms and nations, allotting to them even the remotest frontiers. They took over the country of Sihon, king of Heshbon, and the country of Og, king of Bashan. You made their sons as numerous as the stars in the sky, and you brought them into the land that you told their fathers to enter and possess. Their sons went in and took possession of the land. You subdued before them the Canaanites, who lived in the land. You handed the Canaanites over to them, along with their kings and the peoples of the land, to deal with them as they pleased. They captured fortified cities and fertile land. They took possession of houses filled with all kinds of good things, wells already dug, vineyards, olive groves, and fruit trees in abundance. They ate to the full and were well nourished. They reveled in your great goodness. But they were disobedient rebelled against you. They put your law behind their backs. They killed your prophets who had admonished them in order to turn them back to you. They committed awful blasphemies. So you handed them over to their enemies who oppressed them. But when they were oppressed, they cried out to you. From heaven you heard them. And in your great compassion, you gave them deliverers who rescued them from the hand of their enemies. But as soon as they were at rest, they again did what was evil in your sight. Then you abandoned them to the hand of their enemies so that they ruled over them. When they cried out to you again, you heard from heaven, and in your compassion you delivered them time after time. You warned them to return to your law, but they became arrogant and disobeyed your commands. They sinned against your ordinances, by which a man will live if he obeys them. Stubbornly they turned their backs on you, became stiff-necked, and refused to listen. For many years you were patient with them. By your spirit you admonished them through your prophets. Yet they paid no attention, so you handed them over to the neighboring peoples. But in your great mercy you did not put an end to them or abandon them, for you are a gracious and merciful God. Now therefore, O our God, the great, mighty, and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love, do not let all this hardship seem trifling in your eyes. The hardship that has come upon us, upon our kings and leaders, upon our priests and prophets, upon our fathers and all your people, from the days of the kings of Assyria until today. In all that has happened to us, you have been just. You have acted faithfully while we did wrong. Our kings, our leaders, our priests and our fathers did not follow your law. They did not pay attention to your commands or the warnings you gave them. Even while they were in their kingdom, enjoying your great goodness to them in the spacious and fertile land you gave them, they did not serve you or turn from their evil ways. But see, we are slaves today, slaves in the land you gave our forefathers so they could eat its fruit and the other good things it produces. Because of our sins, its abundant harvest goes to the kings you have placed over us. They rule over our bodies and our cattle as they please. We are in great distress. In view of all this, we are making a binding agreement, putting it in writing, and our leaders, our Levites and our priests are affixing their seals to it. Chapter 10. Those who sealed it were Nehemiah the governor, the son of Hakaliah, Zedekiah, Sareah, Azariah, Jeremiah, Pasher, Amariah, Melchijah, Hattish, Shebaniah, Malak, Aram, Miramoth, Obadiah, Daniel, Ginnathon, 
Barak, Meshulam, Abijah, Minjamin, Meaziah, Bilgai, and Shemaiah. These were the priests. The Levites, Jeshua, son of Azaniah, Binuai of the sons of Henadad, Cadmiel, and their associates, Shebaniah, Hodiah, Kalita, Peleah, Hanan, Micah, Rehob, Hashabiah, Zachar, Sherebiah, Shebaniah, Hodiah, Benai, and Beninu, the leaders of the people, Perosh, Pehath Moab, Elam, Zatu, Benai, Bunai, Asgad, Bibai, Adonijah, Bigvi, Aden, Ater, Hezekiah, Azer, Hodiah, Hashem, Bezai, Harif, Anathoth, Nebai, Magpiash, Meshulam, Hezer, Meshezebel, Zadok, Jadua, Pelatiah, Hanan, Anea, Hoshea, Hananiah, Hashab, Elohesh, Pilha, Shobek, Rehum, Hashabna, Maasea, Ahia, Hanan, Anan, Malak, Haram, and Baana. The rest of the people, priests, Levites, gatekeepers, singers, temple servants, and all who separated themselves from the neighboring peoples for the sake of the law of God, together with their wives and all their sons and daughters who are able to understand, all these now join their brothers, the nobles, and bind themselves with a curse and an oath to follow the law of God given through Moses, the servant of God, and to obey carefully all the commands, regulations, and decrees of the Lord our Lord. We promise not to give our daughters in marriage to the peoples around us or to take their daughters for our sons. When the neighboring peoples bring merchandise or grain to sell on the Sabbath, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or on any holy day. Every seventh year we will forego working the land and will cancel all debts. We assume the responsibility for carrying out the commands to give a third of a shekel each year for the service of the house of our God, for the bread set out on the table, for the regular grain offerings and burnt offerings, for the offerings on the Sabbaths, new moon festivals and appointed feasts, for the holy offerings, for sin offerings to make atonement for Israel and for all the duties of the house of our God. We, the priests, the Levites, and the people have cast lots to determine when each of our families is to bring to the house of our God at set times each year a contribution of wood to burn on the altar of the Lord our God as it is written in the law. We also assume responsibility for bringing to the house of the Lord each year the first fruits of our crops and every fruit tree. As it is also written in the law, we will bring the firstborn of our sons and of our cattle, of our herds and of our flocks to the house of our God, to the priests ministering there. Moreover, we will bring to the storerooms of the house of our God, to the priests, the first of our ground meal, of our grain offerings, of the fruit of all our trees and of our new wine and oil. And we will bring a tithe of our crops to the Levites, for it is the Levites who collect the tithes in all the towns where we work. A priest descended from Aaron is to accompany the Levites when they receive the tithes, and the Levites are to bring a tenth of the tithes up to the house of our God, to the storerooms of the treasury. The people of Israel, including the Levites, are to bring their contributions of grain, new wine, and oil to the storerooms where the articles for the sanctuary are kept and where the ministering priests, the gatekeepers, and the singers stay. We will not neglect the house of our God. Chapter 11 Now the leaders of the people settled in Jerusalem, and the rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of every ten to live in Jerusalem, the holy city while the remaining nine were to stay in their own towns. The people commended all the men who volunteered to live in Jerusalem. These are the provincial leaders who settled in Jerusalem. Now some Israelites, priests, Levites, temple servants, and descendants of Solomon's servants lived in the towns of Judah, each on his own property in the various towns, 
while other people from both Judah and Benjamin lived in Jerusalem. From the descendants of Judah, Athaiah, son of Uzziah, the son of Zechariah, the son of Amariah, the son of Shephatiah, the son of Mahalalel, a descendant of Perez, and Maaseah, son of Barak, the son of Kolhoza, the son of Isaiah, the son of Adaiah, the son of Joyarib, the son of Zechariah, a descendant of Shelah. The descendants of Perez, who lived in Jerusalem, totaled 468 able men. From the descendants of Benjamin, Salud, son of Meshulam, the son of Joed, the son of Pedeah, the son of Koleah, the son of Maaseah, the son of Ithiel, the son of Jesheah, and his followers, Gabai and Salai, 928 men. Joel, son of Zikri, was their chief officer, and Judah, son of Hasanua, was over the second district of the city. From the priests, Judea, the son of Joerim, Jachin, Sereah, son of Hilkiah, the son of Meshulam, the son of Zadok, the son of Mareoth, the son of Ahitub, supervisor in the house of God, and their associates who carried on work for the temple, 822 men. Adea, son of Jeroham, the son of Pelaliah, the son of Amzai, the son of Zechariah, the son of Pashur, the son of Malchijah, and his associates, who were heads of families, 242 men. Amashsai, son of Azarel, the son of Azai, the son of Meshillamoth, the son of Immer, and his associates, who were able men, 128. Their chief officer was Zabdiel, son of Hagadolam. From the Levites, Shemaiah, son of Hashab, the son of Azrakam, the son of Hashabiah, the son of Bunai, Shabbathai and Josabad, two of the heads of the Levites who had charge of the outside work of the house of God. Mataniah, son of Micah, the son of Zabdi, the son of Asaph, the director who led in thanksgiving and prayer. Bakbakiah, second among his associates, and Abda, son of Shemua, the son of Galal, the son of Jeduthun. The Levites in the holy city totaled 284. The gatekeepers, Akab, Talman, and their associates, who kept watch at the gates, 172 men. The rest of the Israelites, with the priests and Levites, were in all the towns of Judah, each on his ancestral property. The temple servants lived on the hill of Ophel, and Ziha and Gishpa were in charge of them. The chief officer of the Levites in Jerusalem was Uzai, son of Benai, the son of Hashabiah, the son of Mataniah, the son of Micah, Uzai was one of Asaph's descendants, who were the singers responsible for the service of the house of God. The singers were under the king's orders, which regulated their daily activity. Pethahiah, son of Meshezabel, one of the descendants of Zerah, son of Judah, was the king's agent in all affairs relating to the people. As for the villages with their fields, some of the people of Judah lived in Kiriath Arba and its surrounding settlements in Dibon and its settlements, in Jacabzeel and its villages, in Jeshua, in Molada, in Beth Pilat, in Hazer Shul, in Beersheba and its settlements, in Ziklag, in Makona and its settlements, in Enrimon, in Zorah, in Jarmuth, Zenoa, Adullam and their villages, in Lachish and its fields, and in Azekah and its settlements. So they were living all the way from Beersheba to the valley of Hinnom. The descendants of the Benjamites from Geba lived in Michmash, Aja, Bethel, and its settlements, in Anathoth, Nob, and Ananiah, in Hazor, Ramah, and Gittim, in Hadid, Zeboam, and Nabalat, in Lod, and Ono, and in the valley of the craftsmen. Some of the divisions of the Levites of Judah settled in Benjamin. Chapter 12. These were the priests and Levites who returned with Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and with Jeshua, Sareah, Jeremiah, Ezra, Amariah, Malak, Hattush, Shechaniah, Rehum, Miramoth, Iddo, Ginnathan, Abijah, Midjamin, Moadiah, Bilgah, 
Shemea, Joyrib, Judea, Salu, Amok, Hilkiah, and Judea. These were the leaders of the priests and their associates in the days of Jeshua. The Levites were Jeshua, Binuai, Cadmiel, Sherebiah, Judah, and also Mataniah, who, together with his associates, was in charge of the songs of thanksgiving. Bakbakiah and Anai, their associates, stood opposite them in the services. Jeshua was the father of Joachim, Joachim the father of Eliashib, Eliashib the father of Joiada, Joiada the father of Jonathan, and Jonathan the father of Jadua. In the days of Joachim, these were the heads of the priestly families. Of Sarai's family, Moriah, of Jeremiah's, Hananiah, of Ezra's, Meshulam, of Amariah's, Jehohanan, of Malik's, Jonathan, of Shechaniah's, Joseph, of Haram's, Adna, of Miramoth's, Helkai, of Iddo's, Zechariah, of Genethan's, Meshulam, of Abijah's, Zikri, of Minyamin's, and of Moadiah's, Piltai, of Bilga's, Shemua, of Shemaiah's, Jehonathan, of Joyarib's, Matani, of Judea's, Uzai, of Salu's, Kalai, of Amok's, Eber, of Hilkiah's, Hashabiah, of Judea's, Nathanel. The family heads of the Levites in the days of Eliashib, Joiada, Johanan, and Jadua, as well as those of the priests, were recorded in the reign of Darius the Persian. The family heads among the descendants of Levi, up to the time of Johanan, son of Eliashib, were recorded in the book of the Annals. And the leaders of the Levites were Hashabiah, Sherebiah, Jeshua, son of Cadmiel, and their associates, who stood opposite them to give praise and thanksgiving, one section responding to the other, as prescribed by David, the man of God. Mataniah, Bakbakiah, Obadiah, Meshulam, Talman, and Akub were gatekeepers who guarded the storerooms at the gates. They served in the days of Joachim, son of Jeshua, the son of Josadak, and in the days of Nehemiah the governor, and of Ezra the priest and scribe. At the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, the Levites were sought out from where they lived and were brought to Jerusalem to celebrate joyfully the dedication with songs of thanksgiving and with the music of cymbals, harps, and lyres. The singers also were brought together from the region around Jerusalem, from the villages of the Netophathites, from Beth Gilgal, and from the area of Geba and Asmaveth, for the singers had built villages for themselves around Jerusalem. When the priests and Levites had purified themselves ceremonially, they purified the people, the gates, and the wall. I had the leaders of Judah go up on top of the wall. I also assigned two large choirs to give thanks. One was to proceed on top of the wall to the right toward the dung gate. Hoshaya and half the leaders of Judah followed them, along with Azariah, Ezra, Meshulam, Judah, Benjamin, Shimea, Jeremiah, as well as some priests with trumpets, and also Zechariah, son of Jonathan, the son of Shimea, the son of Mataneah, the son of Micaiah, the son of Zachar, the son of Asaph, and his associates, Shemea, Azarel, Milalai, Gilalai, Mai, Nathanel, Judah, and Hanani, with musical instruments prescribed by David, the man of God. Ezra the scribe led the procession. At the fountain gate, they continued directly up the steps of the city of David on the ascent to the wall, and passed above the house of David to the water gate on the east. The second choir proceeded in the opposite direction. I followed them on top of the wall, together with half the people, past the tower of the ovens to the broad wall, over the gate of Ephraim, the Jeshina gate, the fish gate, the tower of Hananel, and the tower of the hundred, as far as the sheep gate. At the gate of the guard, they stopped. The two choirs that gave thanks then took their places in the house of God. So did I together with half the officials, as well as the priests, Eliakim, Maaseah, 
Minyamin, Micaiah, Eliel Enai, Zechariah, and Hananiah with their trumpets, and also Maaseah, Shemaiah, Eleazar, Uzai, Jehohanan, Malchijah, Elam, and Ezer. The choir sang under the direction of Jezrahiah, and on that day they offered great sacrifices, rejoicing because God had given them great joy. The women and children also rejoiced. The sound of rejoicing in Jerusalem could be heard far away. At that time, men were appointed to be in charge of the storerooms for the contributions, first fruits, and tithes. From the fields around the towns, they were to bring into the storerooms the portions required by the law for the priests and the Levites. For Judah was pleased with the ministering priests and Levites. They performed the service of their God and the service of purification, as did also the singers and gatekeepers, according to the commands of David and his son Solomon. For long ago, in the days of David and Asaph, there had been directors for the singers and for the songs of praise and thanksgiving to God. So in the days of Zerubbabel and of Nehemiah, all Israel contributed the daily portions for the singers and gatekeepers. They also set aside the portion for the other Levites, and the Levites set aside the portion for the descendants of Aaron. Chapter 13 On that day the book of Moses was read aloud in the hearing of the people, and there it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever be admitted into the assembly of God, because they had not met the Israelites with food and water, but had hired Balaam to call a curse down on them. Our God, however, turned the curse into a blessing. When the people heard this law, they excluded from Israel all who were of foreign descent. Before this, Eliashib the priest had been put in charge of the storerooms of the house of our God. He was closely associated with Tobiah, and he had provided him with a large room formerly used to store the grain offerings and incense and temple articles, and also the tithes of grain, new wine, and oil prescribed for the Levites, singers, and gatekeepers, as well as the contributions for the priests. But while all this was going on, I was not in Jerusalem, for in the thirty-second year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. Sometime later, I asked his permission and came back to Jerusalem. Here I learned about the evil thing Eliashib had done in providing Tobiah a room in the courts of the house of God. I was greatly displeased and threw all Tobiah's household goods out of the room. I gave orders to purify the rooms, and then I put back into them the equipment of the house of God with the grain offerings and the incense. I also learned that the portions assigned to the Levites had not been given to them, and that all the Levites and singers responsible for the service had gone back to their own fields. So I rebuked the officials and asked them, Why is the house of God neglected? Then I called them together and stationed them at their posts. All Judah brought the tithes of grain, new wine, and oil into the storerooms. I put Shelemiah the priest, Zadok the scribe, and a Levite named Pedeah in charge of the storerooms, and made Hanan son of Zachar, the son of Mataniah, their assistant. Because these men were considered trustworthy, they were made responsible for distributing the supplies to their brothers. Remember me for this, O my God, and do not blot out what I have so faithfully done for the house of my God and its services. In those days I saw men in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in grain and loading it on donkeys, together with wine, grapes, figs, and all other kinds of loads. And they were bringing all this into Jerusalem on the Sabbath. Therefore I warned them against selling food on that day. Men from Tyre who lived in Jerusalem were bringing in fish and all kinds of merchandise and selling them in Jerusalem on the Sabbath to the people of Judah. I rebuked the nobles of Judah and said to them, What is this wicked thing you are doing, desecrating the Sabbath day? Didn't your forefathers do the same things so that our God brought all this calamity upon us and upon this city? Now you're stirring up more wrath against Israel by desecrating the Sabbath. When evening shadows fell on the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, I ordered the doors to be shut and not opened until the Sabbath was over, 
I stationed some of my own men at the gates so that no load could be brought in on the Sabbath day. Once or twice the merchants and sellers of all kinds of goods spent the night outside Jerusalem. But I warned them and said, Why do you spend the night by the wall? If you do this again, I will lay hands on you. From that time on, they no longer came on the Sabbath. Then I commanded the Levites to purify themselves and go and guard the gates in order to keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember me for this also, O my God, and show mercy to me according to your great love. Moreover, in those days I saw men of Judah who had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod or the language of one of the other peoples and did not know how to speak the language of Judah. I rebuked them and called curses down on them. I beat some of the men and pulled out their hair. I made them take an oath in God's name and said, You are not to give your daughters in marriage to their sons, nor are you to take their daughters in marriage for your sons or for yourselves. Was it not because of marriages like these that Solomon, king of Israel, sinned? Among the many nations there was no king like him. He was loved by his God, and God made him king over all Israel. But even he was led into sin by foreign women. Must we hear now that you too are doing all this terrible wickedness and are being unfaithful to our God by marrying foreign women? One of the sons of Joiada, son of Eliashib, the high priest, was son-in-law to Sanballat, the Horonite, and I drove him away from me. Remember them, O my God, because they defiled the priestly office and the covenant of the priesthood and of the Levites. So I purified the priests and the Levites of everything foreign and assigned them duties, each to his own task. I also made provision for contributions of wood at designated times, and for the first fruits. Remember me with favor, O my God. Esther, chapter 1. This is what happened during the time of Xerxes. The Xerxes who ruled over 127 provinces, stretching from India to Cush. At that time, King Xerxes reigned from his royal throne in the citadel of Susa. And in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his nobles and officials. The military leaders of Persia and Media, the princes and the nobles of the provinces were present. For a full 180 days, he displayed the vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and glory of his majesty. When these days were over, the king gave a banquet lasting seven days in the enclosed garden of the king's palace for all the people from the least to the greatest who were in the citadel of Susa. The garden had hangings of white and blue linen fastened with cords of white linen and purple material to silver rings on marble pillars. There were couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of porphyry, marble, mother of pearl, and other costly stones. Wine was served in goblets of gold, each one different from the other, and the royal wine was abundant in keeping with the king's liberality. By the king's command, each guest was allowed to drink in his own way, for the king instructed all the wine stewards to serve each man what he wished. Queen Vashti also gave a banquet for the women in the royal palace of King Xerxes. On the seventh day, when King Xerxes was in high spirits from wine, he commanded the seven eunuchs who served him, Mahuman, Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, Abagtha, Zethar, and Carcass, to bring before him Queen Vashti wearing her royal crown in order to display her beauty to the people and nobles, for she was lovely to look at. But when the attendants delivered the king's command, Queen Vashti refused to come. Then the king became furious and burned with anger. Since it was customary for the king to consult experts in matters of law and justice, he spoke with the wise men who understood the times and were closest to the king, Karshina, Shethar, Admetha, Tarshish, Meres, Marcina, and Mamukin, the seven nobles of Persia and Media, who had special access to the king and were highest in the kingdom. According to law, what must be done to Queen Vashti? He asked. She has not obeyed the command of King Xerxes that the eunuchs have taken to her. Then Mamukin replied in the presence of the king and the nobles, Queen Vashti has done wrong, not only against the king, but also against all the nobles and the peoples of all the provinces of King Xerxes. 
for the Queen's conduct will become known to all the women, and so they will despise their husbands and say, King Xerxes commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, but she would not come. This very day, the Persian and Median women of the nobility who have heard about the Queen's conduct will respond to all the King's nobles in the same way. There will be no end of disrespect and discord. Therefore, if it pleases the king, let him issue a royal decree and let it be written in the laws of Persia and Media, which cannot be repealed, that Vashti is never again to enter the presence of King Xerxes. Also, let the king give her royal position to someone else who is better than she. Then, when the king's edict is proclaimed throughout all his vast realm, all the women will respect their husbands, from the least to the greatest. The king and his nobles were pleased with this advice, so the king did as Mamukin proposed. He sent dispatches to all parts of the kingdom, to each province in its own script, and to each people in its own language, proclaiming in each people's tongue that every man should be ruler over his own household. Chapter 2 Later, when the anger of King Xerxes had subsided, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what he had decreed about her. Then the king's personal attendants proposed, Let a search be made for beautiful young virgins for the king. Let the king appoint commissioners in every province of his realm to bring all these beautiful girls into the harem at the citadel of Susa. Let them be placed under the care of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women and let beauty treatments be given to them. Then let the girl who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This advice appealed to the king, and he followed it. Now there was in the citadel of Susa a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin, named Mordecai, son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, who had been carried into exile from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, among those taken captive with Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, whom he had brought up because she had neither father nor mother. This girl, who was also known as Esther, was lovely in form and features, and Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother died. When the king's order and edict had been proclaimed, many girls were brought to the citadel of Susa and put under the care of Haggai. Esther also was taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Haggai, who had charge of the harem. The girl pleased him and won his favor. Immediately, he provided her with her beauty treatments and special food. He assigned to her seven maids selected from the king's palace and moved her and her maids into the best place in the harem. Esther had not revealed her nationality and family background because Mordecai had forbidden her to do so. Every day he walked back and forth near the courtyard of the harem to find out how Esther was and what was happening to her. Before a girl's turn came to go into King Xerxes, she had to complete 12 months of beauty treatments prescribed for the women, six months with oil of myrrh, and six with perfumes and cosmetics. And this is how she would go to the king. Anything she wanted was given her to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening she would go there, and in the morning return to another part of the harem to the care of Sheashgaz, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the concubines. She would not return to the king unless he was pleased with her and summoned her by name. When the turn came for Esther, the girl Mordecai had adopted, the daughter of his uncle Abihail, to go to the king, she asked for nothing other than what Haggai, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the harem, suggested. And Esther won the favor of everyone who saw her. She was taken to King Xerxes in the royal residence in the tenth month, the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. Now the king was attracted to Esther more than to any of the other women, and she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet, for all his nobles and officials. He proclaimed a holiday throughout the provinces and distributed gifts with royal liberality. When the virgins were assembled a second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, but Esther had kept secret her family background and nationality, just as Mordecai had told her to do, 
for she continued to follow Mordecai's instructions as she had done when he was bringing her up. During the time Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthana and Tiaresh, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, became angry and conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. But Mordecai found out about the plot and told Queen Esther, who in turn reported it to the king, giving credit to Mordecai. And when the report was investigated and found to be true, the two officials were hanged on a gallows. All this was recorded in the Book of the Annals in the presence of the king. Chapter 3 After these events, King Xerxes honored Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, elevating him and giving him a seat of honor higher than that of all the other nobles. All the royal officials at the king's gate knelt down and paid honor to Haman, for the king had commanded this concerning him. But Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor. Then the royal officials at the king's gate asked Mordecai, Why do you disobey the king's command? Day after day they spoke to him, but he refused to comply. Therefore they told Haman about it to see whether Mordecai's behavior would be tolerated, for he had told them he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor, he was enraged. Yet having learned who Mordecai's people were, he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. In the twelfth year of King Xerxes, in the first month, the month of Nisan, they cast the pure, that is, the lot, in the presence of Haman, to select a day and month. And the lot fell on the twelfth month, the month of Adar. Then Haman said to King Xerxes, There is a certain people dispersed and scattered among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom, whose customs are different from those of all other people, and who do not obey the king's laws. It is not in the king's best interest to tolerate them. If it pleases the king, let a decree be issued to destroy them, and I will put ten thousand talents of silver into the royal treasury for the men who carry out this business. So the king took his signet ring from his finger and gave it to Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. Keep the money, the king said to Haman, and do with the people as you please. Then on the thirteenth day of the first month, the royal secretaries were summoned. They wrote out in the script of each province and in the language of each people all Haman's orders to the king's satraps, the governors of the various provinces, and the nobles of the various peoples. These were written in the name of King Xerxes himself and sealed with his own ring. Dispatches were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with the order to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women and little children, on a single day the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. A copy of the text of the edict was to be issued as law in every province and made known to the people of every nationality, so they would be ready for that day. Spurred on by the king's command, the couriers went out, and the edict was issued in the citadel of Susa. The king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was bewildered. Chapter 4 when Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. But he went only as far as the king's gate, because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province to which the edict and order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs assigned to attend her, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa, to show to Esther and explain it to her, and he told him to urge her to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Hathak went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, 
all the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that he be put to death. The only exception to this is for the king to extend the gold scepter to him and spare his life. But thirty days have passed since I was called to go to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa, and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. Chapter 5 On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the palace, in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall, facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her and held out to her the gold scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. Then the king asked, What is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom it will be given you. If it pleases the king, replied Esther, let the king, together with Haman, come today to a banquet I have prepared for him. Bring Haman at once, the king said, so that we may do what Esther asks. So the king and Haman went to the banquet Esther had prepared. As they were drinking wine, the king again asked Esther, Now what is your petition? It will be given you. And what is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. Esther replied, My petition and my request is this. If the king regards me with favor, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come tomorrow to the banquet I will prepare for them. Then I will answer the king's question. Haman went out that day happy and in high spirits. But when he saw Mordecai at the king's gate and observed that he neither rose nor showed fear in his presence, he was filled with rage against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home. Calling together his friends and Zeresh his wife, Haman boasted to them about his vast wealth, his many sons, and all the ways the king had honored him and how he had elevated him above the other nobles and officials. And that's not all, Haman added. I'm the only person Queen Esther invited to accompany the king to the banquet she gave. And she has invited me along with the king tomorrow. But all this gives me no satisfaction, as long as I see that Jew Mordecai sitting at the king's gate. His wife Zeresh and all his friends said to him, Have a gallows built, 75 feet high, and ask the king in the morning to have Mordecai hanged on it. Then go with the king to the dinner and be happy. This suggestion delighted Haman, and he had the gallows built. Chapter 6 That night the king could not sleep, so he ordered the book of the Chronicles, the record of his reign, to be brought in and read to him. It was found recorded there that Mordecai had exposed Bigthana and Tirish, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway who had conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. What honor and recognition has Mordecai received for this? The king asked. Nothing has been done for him, his attendants answered. The king said, Who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the palace to speak to the king about hanging Mordecai on the gallows he had erected for him. His attendants answered, Haman is standing in the court. Bring him in, the king ordered. When Haman entered, the king asked him, what should be done for the man the king delights to honor? Now Haman thought to himself, Who is there that the king would rather honor than me? So he answered the king, For the man the king delights to honor, have them bring a royal robe the king has worn, and a horse the king has ridden, one with a royal crest placed on its head. Then let the robe and horse be entrusted to one of the king's most noble princes. Let them robe the man the king delights to honor, 
and lead him on the horse through the city streets, proclaiming before him, This is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. Go at once, the king commanded Haman. Get the robe and the horse and do just as you have suggested for Mordecai the Jew, who sits at the king's gate. Do not neglect anything you have recommended. So Haman got the robe and the horse. He robed Mordecai and led him on horseback through the city streets, proclaiming before him, This is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. Afterward, Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman rushed home with his head covered in grief and told Zeresh his wife and all his friends everything that had happened to him. His advisors and his wife Zeresh said to him, Since Mordecai, before whom your downfall has started, is of Jewish origin, you cannot stand against him. You will surely come to ruin. While they were still talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried Haman away to the banquet Esther had prepared. Chapter 7 So the king and Haman went to dine with Queen Esther, and as they were drinking wine on that second day, the king again asked, Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given you. What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor with you, O king, and if it pleases your majesty, grant me my life. This is my petition. And spare my people. This is my request. For I and my people have been sold for destruction and slaughter and annihilation. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet, because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, Who is he? Where is the man who has dared to do such a thing? Esther said, The adversary and enemy is this vile Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and queen. The king got up in a rage, left his wine, and went out into the palace garden. But Haman, realizing that the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. Just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining. The king exclaimed, Will he even molest the queen while she is with me in the house? As soon as the word left the king's mouth, They covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs attending the king, said, A gallows, seventy-five feet high, stands by Haman's house. He had it made from Mordecai, who spoke up to help the king. The king said, Hang him on it. So they hanged Haman on the gallows he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's fury subsided. Chapter 8 That same day, King Xerxes gave Queen Esther the estate of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came into the presence of the king, for Esther had told how he was related to her. The king took off his signet ring, which he had reclaimed from Haman, and presented it to Mordecai. And Esther appointed him over Haman's estate. Esther again pleaded with the king, falling at his feet and weeping. She begged him to put an end to the evil plan of Haman the Agagite, which he had devised against the Jews. Then the king extended the gold scepter to Esther, and she arose and stood before him. If it pleases the king, she said, and if he regards me with favor and thinks it the right thing to do, and if he is pleased with me, let an order be written, overruling the dispatches that Haman, son of Hamadatha the Agagite, devised and wrote to destroy the Jews in all the king's provinces. For how can I bear to see disaster fall on my people? How can I bear to see the destruction of my family? King Xerxes replied to Queen Esther and to Mordecai the Jew, Because Haman attacked the Jews, I have given his estate to Esther, and they have hanged him on the gallows. Now write another decree in the king's name in behalf of the Jews as seems best to you, and seal it with the king's signet ring. For no document written in the king's name and sealed with his ring can be revoked. At once, the royal secretaries were summoned. On the twenty-third day of the third month, the month of Sivan, they wrote out all Mordecai's orders to the Jews, and to the satraps, governors, and nobles of the 127 provinces stretching from India to Kush. These orders were written in the script of each province and the language of each people, and also to the Jews in their own script and language. Mordecai wrote in the name of King Xerxes, sealed the dispatches with the king's signet ring, and sent them by mounted couriers who rode fast horses especially bred for the king. The king's edict granted the Jews in every city the right to assemble and protect themselves, 
to destroy, kill, and annihilate any armed force of any nationality or province that might attack them and their women and children, and to plunder the property of their enemies. The day appointed for the Jews to do this in all the provinces of King Xerxes was the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, the month of Adar. A copy of the text of the edict was to be issued as law in every province and made known to the people of every nationality, so that the Jews would be ready on that day to avenge themselves on their enemies. The couriers, riding the royal horses, raced out, spurred on by the king's command, and the edict was also issued in the citadel of Susa. Mordecai left the king's presence wearing royal garments of blue and white, a large crown of gold and a purple robe of fine linen. And the city of Susa held a joyous celebration. For the Jews it was a time of happiness and joy, gladness and honor. In every province and in every city, wherever the edict of the king went, there was joy and gladness among the Jews, with feasting and celebrating. And many people of other nationalities became Jews because fear of the Jews had seized them. Chapter 9 On the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, the month of Adar, the edict commanded by the king was to be carried out. On this day the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them, but now the tables were turned and the Jews got the upper hand over those who hated them. The Jews assembled in their cities in all the provinces of King Xerxes to attack those seeking their destruction. No one could stand against them, because the people of all the other nationalities were afraid of them. And all the nobles of the provinces, the satraps, the governors, and the king's administrators helped the Jews, because fear of Mordecai had seized them. Mordecai was prominent in the palace. His reputation spread throughout the provinces, and he became more and more powerful. The Jews struck down all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them, and they did what they pleased to those who hated them. In the citadel of Susa, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men. They also killed Parshandatha, Dalphon, Aspatha, Boratha, Adalia, Aridatha, Parmashta, Arasai, Aradai, and Vizatha, the ten sons of Haman, son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. But they did not lay their hands on the plunder. The number of those slain in the citadel of Susa was reported to the king that same day. The king said to Queen Esther, The Jews have killed and destroyed five hundred men and the ten sons of Haman in the citadel of Susa. What have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now what is your petition? It will be given you. What is your request? It will also be granted. If it pleases the king, Esther answered, Give the Jews in Susa permission to carry out this day's edict tomorrow also. And let Haman's ten sons be hanged on gallows. So the king commanded that this be done. An edict was issued in Susa, and they hanged the ten sons of Haman. The Jews in Susa came together on the fourteenth day of the month of Adar, and they put to death in Susa three hundred men, but they did not lay their hands on the plunder. Meanwhile, the remainder of the Jews who were in the king's provinces also assembled to protect themselves and get relief from their enemies. They killed 75,000 of them, but did not lay their hands on the plunder. This happened on the 13th day of the month of Adar, and on the 14th they rested and made it a day of feasting and joy. The Jews in Susa, however, had assembled on the 13th and 14th, and then on the 15th they rested and made it a day of feasting and joy. That is why rural Jews, those living in villages, observe the 14th of the month of Adar as a day of joy and feasting, a day for giving presents to each other. Mordecai recorded these events, and he sent letters to all the Jews throughout the provinces of King Xerxes, near and far, to have them celebrate annually the 14th and 15th days of the month of Adar, as the time when the Jews got relief from their enemies and as the month when their sorrow was turned into joy and their mourning into a day of celebration. He wrote them to observe the days as days of feasting and joy and giving presents of food to one another and gifts to the poor. So the Jews agreed to continue the celebration they had begun, doing what Mordecai had written to them. For Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of all the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to destroy them and had cast the pure, that is the lot, for their ruin and destruction. 
but when the plot came to the king's attention, he issued written orders that the evil scheme Haman had devised against the Jews should come back onto his own head, and that he and his sons should be hanged on the gallows. Therefore these days were called Purim, from the word pure. Because of everything written in this letter, and because of what they had seen and what had happened to them, the Jews took it upon themselves to establish the custom that they and their descendants and all who joined them should without fail observe these two days every year in the way prescribed and at the time appointed. These days should be remembered and observed in every generation by every family and in every province and in every city. And these days of Purim should never cease to be celebrated by the Jews, nor should the memory of them die out among their descendants. So Queen Esther, daughter of Abihail, along with Mordecai the Jew, wrote with full authority to confirm this second letter concerning Purim. And Mordecai sent letters to all the Jews in the 127 provinces of the kingdom of Xerxes, words of goodwill and assurance, to establish these days of Purim at their designated times, as Mordecai the Jew and Queen Esther had decreed for them, and as they had established for themselves and their descendants in regard to their times of fasting and lamentation. Esther's decree confirmed these regulations about Purim, and it was written down in the records. Chapter 10 King Xerxes imposed tribute throughout the empire, to its distant shores, and all his acts of power and might, together with a full account of the greatness of Mordecai, to which the king had raised him, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Media and Persia? Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Xerxes, preeminent among the Jews, and held in high esteem by his many fellow Jews, because he worked for the good of his people, and spoke up for the welfare of all the Jews.